Hey, what's up, YouTube? It's Tom here. In this video, I want to show you how this company has made over $65,000 in profit, over $100,000 in sales in just a few short months of selling their product on Amazon. So the first things first I'm going to do is I'm going to log into our Helium 10 dashboard and I want to show you we launched the product on August the 28th and today is December the 29th and you can see that the product has done over $133,000 in revenue and the coolest part is that it's $68,000 in profit. In fact, we ran out of stock, but if we just go to this month, which is December, you can see that we did $75,000 per month just in December and we did $38,000 a month in profit. Now we ran out of stock. I think if we didn't run out of stock, we do over $100,000 just in this one month alone, which is crazy. In this video, I actually want to go over, you know, how we come up with that idea. Um, how did, it's, when I say we, it's actually not we, it's Jenny, uh, Terry and Tony, three of my friends that came up with this puzzles company. I'm just helping them with the Amazon side of things. They did all the heavy lifting and I'm just consulting and advising them with the Amazon side of things. But throughout this experience, I personally learned so much that I think is going to be very, very applicable for you guys as well. So I asked my Instagram, I asked my YouTube channel, like what kind of questions they asked. I had a lot of feedback. So I'm just gonna basically go over some of the questions as well as some of the backstory of Odd Pieces. So let's jump into it. What is the actual product itself? It's called Odd Pieces Jigsaw Puzzle. You're like, puzzle company? That's right, it's selling puzzles on Amazon, that's crazy. This is the uh, puzzle company that my friend Tony, Jenny, and Terry started. You see, they started this company because during COVID, they were really, really bored, right? We're all locked down, they were playing a lot of puzzles, and they felt like every single puzzle that they were playing was pretty much the same puzzles. Like it was, it was nothing exciting anymore, right? So they say, well, how can we improve upon this? How can we think of a better way to do this? So they created this company called Odd Pieces. And in fact, what they've done is they actually launched this product up on Kickstarter first. So if you go to Kickstarter and then type in Odd Pieces, you can actually see their Kickstarter campaigns. This is one of their newest Kickstarter campaigns right here, where uh, this is the second series, but the very first series, they raised over $500,000, which is absolutely insane. Basically, the first question that a lot of people ask is like, how do they actually find the product idea? Well, like I said, they played puzzles from regular puzzles to generic stock photo images, to puzzles where you didn't know what you were building, right? It was fun, it was addicting, but every single product that they built, every single puzzle that they built, they were asking themselves, how can we make this better? How can we make it more fun? How can we make it even more surprising? So they combined the best elements of multiple puz puzzles that they played with, and they mashed it together into odd pieces. I love this because first, they they basically took the, the like different elements of what's already working, they combine into one to differentiate their product to make their product better, right? And what's also interesting is someone asked like, how many ideas did you have to go through before you chose this one as the final version? Or was it the only idea that they're like, hey, we're gonna do this and then boom, it became this multi-million dollar company. That could not be farther away from the truth because this is actually their 10th iteration from the initial idea. Basically, what they did was they had this idea in their mind, and what they did was they actually spoke to users of puzzles. They spoke to puzzle lovers. I remember them asking people like, hey, do you play puzzles? I was like, not really, so they didn't speak to me. But they spoke to people that played puzzles. So they are asking him, hey, do you like this? Do you like that? They were basically doing focus groups. And I really feel like that's one thing that Amazon sellers are not doing well these days. They don't actually ask the customers the right questions. Doesn't matter what kind of business you wanna launch, you are serving a specific target market, you are ser serving a specific set of customers, and it's so important for you to understand what they want, not what you want, what they want. That's how you get to product market fit. It's by taking in the customer information and basically improving upon your product. And someone also asked like, how are they gonna differentiate in this market? I mean, it's puzzles, it's very, very competitive. And what type of public validation was done? So what they did was they identify the market and sell through viability based on competitors' market performance. And they also pitched the ideas to friends and family, focus on the problem on why it was a bad idea, then fix them. They tested the initial value and benefit messaging 
with at least 10 different tests. And they also play tested with a lot of their friends. They literally give them these puzzles. They literally gave them these samples and be like, hey, play with them. I'm gonna watch you and then see how it goes. In terms of their pre-launch strategy, right? Um, it was basically just Kickstarter. That's how they launched. They spent $8,000 on Kickstarter. Uh, that's for the product samples, that is for the video, that is for the photos, that is for email collection. And on top of that, they launched on Kickstarter and raised $500,000 from pre-orders. Over 10,000 customers, 40,000 puzzles were sold. And then they migrated to Shopify after to continue pre-orders and they collected a lot of emails. So what's interesting about this brand is that they didn't launch on Amazon. They launched off of Amazon. And when I was like talking to them, cause they're good friends of mine, I'm like, why don't you guys put it on Amazon? They're like, well, you know, it's just one of those things that they wanted to do, but you know, due to bandwidth, they didn't do. And I said, well, what if I just helped you guys out? Now, I don't want to take any credit because I really didn't do much. Um, I just, it was such an amazing product, such amazing brand already that it's very, very easy for me to take a brand like that and just put it on Amazon, right? They already have the photos. We did the keyword research. We send initial batches to Amazon, which is only 300 pieces of each SKU, so we can only send a thousand units. And then from there, we basically just use a PPC. Shout out to Liron from Incremental Digital to help us with PPC. You can check out his link below this video as well. He's one of the best PPC experts in the game and I absolutely love his service. So that's pretty much all we did. If your brand can do really well off of Amazon, you will definitely crush it on Amazon, right? Because you already have all the assets and everything. I really feel like Amazon is the easiest e-commerce business you can start. D2C, like direct to consumer and Shopify is pretty difficult. And if you can crack the D2C side, Amazon will be like absolute joke for you. That's what I truly believe, right? So they run on Kickstarter, they did Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, and they also did influencers as well. And then someone asked, did they use Alibaba? So basically when they, uh, they started their search via Alibaba, after they launched on a Kickstarter campaign, suppliers started reaching out to us wanting to partner. So I guess a lot of suppliers actually go on Kickstarter and then see if the project needs uh, like some sort of a partnership. That's really, really interesting. So they weren't married to our initial Alibaba suppliers. So uh, we kept our doors open and possibility with many other suppliers because we wanted to pick the best suppliers. We ended up on many different video calls with suppliers and lots and lots of samples sent to the home. There was never too many prospects, right? So it's like dating. I mean, go on many dates as possible so you can find the right one, right? You don't wanna basically go on the first date and then just like, uh, you know, stick to that person, right? You wanna see what's out there. You wanna go fishing, basically. Uh, and there's never too many prospects. When picking suppliers, some of the key questions to ask is, how well can you communicate with this person? That is so, so important. Do they believe in your vision? Only if they believe in your vision, they will think outside the box with you. So it's so important because your manufacturer is your partner. It's not just like your manufacturer. I mean, without your manufacturer, you're pretty screwed, especially in the Amazon space. So think of them as a partner rather than just like, I don't know, um, oh, they're just a manufacturer. I'm not worrying about them. Like you rely on them as much as they rely on you, right? If not the other way around, like you rely on them a lot more than they rely on you. Uh, it's super important that the suppliers is not only following instructions to the T, but also coming up with new ideas based on their expertise. Because their job, they create puzzles. They have so much data information. They are truly the expert in this field. They know what's trending. They know what's not working. They have so much data. So why don't you form that good relationship with your supplier so that you can get the key information. You are partnering up with them, not only for the product itself, but for their expertise in the field. They should know what's trending in this market. Some of the key things that you have to ask yourself is like, how did the samples go? The samples that suppliers send you is the first sign of your working relationship. Was it on time? Did they send you exactly what are you looking for? Are the samples organized? Are they well labeled? Did they send you more than you asked? Did they follow up? All these are signs of a good supplier versus a bad supplier. If you are telling them, hey, I wanna work with you and please send me some samples, here are my instructions. If they can't even get the samples right, do you think they're gonna get your purchase order right? Probably not. So think of it again, very much like dating, right? You gotta make sure that you put them through these tests so that you can find the best possible supply. In terms of designing, cause like Jenny, Terry and, and, and Tony are not designers. So these puzzles, they obviously had a lot of designs on them. So how well did they design? Uh, they didn't do it themselves, they hired someone. So basically what they did is what they searched for high and low 
uh, for talent artists, right? These are the artists that are going to be creating the puzzles and they will basically search in, via Instagram hashtags, Behance portfolios, Reddit forms to find artists to fit the style of work that they were looking for. Uh, Behance is a really, really cool website called Behance.net, I believe. It's where really talented graphic designers go in and post their portfolio. You can go on there for like packaging, labels, branding, logo, whatever it might be. Super, super cool website. Highly recommend all of you to check out. And now here's the coolest thing, right? So when we were selling this product on Amazon, one of the biggest worries for me, for Jenny, for Liron was well, we're selling these puzzles for $35 when everybody on page one of Amazon is selling their puzzles for like $12. How can we compete? I mean, our product is 3X, right? So as you know, many Amazon sellers that are watching this right now, if you don't have enough competitive advantages, you cannot compete on price. So people automatically look, oh, if everybody is selling for $12, I have to sell for $12. Well, clearly this is not the case. They're selling for three times more. So how can they justify this? Well, basically, they designed a product that they truly believe in that's different than the competitors, right? That's when you can justify the pricing difference. They charge two to 2.5x the price of competitors because the puzzles are just different than the competitors. This makes sense. Yes, it's puzzles, but it's also different. They carved out their own blue ocean. There's a really good book in business called Red Ocean, Blue Ocean. Highly recommend for you guys to all read that. Their competitors use regular stock images. We hired real artists who spend hundreds of hours drawing little details specific to their puzzles. The competitors print the image on the puzzles. We design a storyline behind the puzzles and create and include hidden clues, comic strips, riddles, secret endings. It's more than just an image on the puzzle. This requires a storyteller, a copywriter, a comic illustrator, etc. The competitor's puzzle that you are building is exactly the same as the image on the box. There's no surprise when building the puzzles, right? What you see is what you build. Our puzzles is image is slightly different than the box. That means every piece is connecting to a final surprise. And the competitor's package is usually, usually a thousand puzzles in the standard box. They invested a lot of money into creating an elevated unboxing experience. What it includes, it's like the feel of, you know, opening up an iPhone. If any of you have bought an iPhone or Apple product, even for a little AirTag, that's $35. The way you open it, incredible on packaging, packaging experience. This all goes into the justification of being able to charge a little bit more. When you go buy a Apple product or a Louis Vuitton product, is it the same experience as you go buy, uh, I don't know, like something that's cheaper? No. Yes, the product is good, but also the experience is good. So they invested heavily into that as well. And in terms of how long it took them for the launch, well, it took about a year for them to launch. Um, to, desi to design the puzzle game, coordinate the idea with the first round of artists, play test with a group of friends, tweak, and then launch their very first Kickstarter campaign. And then waited one year for feedback and tweak the product more before launching on Amazon. So we wanna make sure that the product is near to perfect before launching on Amazon. So now I wanna talk about how do they build up a following an audience to get sales or is it just on PPC? So before they launched on Amazon, they were building an audience using Kickstarter already and then uh, with other PPC efforts like Facebook, Instagram, Google, et cetera. Because of this, they already had people searching for this product on Amazon before they were even on Amazon. So it was just a sign that they need to be on Amazon. So when someone sees the brand and wants to get it, where's the first place they wanna be? Well, it's obviously gonna be on Amazon. So in terms of pricing for the product, how did they determine the price of $35? So first what they did was they basically did market research on the range of jigsaw puzzles and board games. Then. They took a look at the price points from the lowest end to the highest end and compared the features. And they knew that they did not want to sell generic product at a low price because that's where puzzle market was mostly saturated already. You do not want to jump into that niche because it is so saturated. A th really interesting uh, concept I came across recently is if you were to launch a business, never ever launch a business where the most amount of saturation is. And what I mean by that is, launch a premium product, launch a cheap product, but never launch in the area where everybody is dancing and playing in because that is the most saturated market. So either go high or go low, but never in the middle. So I absolutely love this. So the ways that they thought of increasing the value of the product, for example, is the value of the puzzles increase of the artwork and illustration of versus a photo. The value of our puzzle increases if the more hours the player needs it to build, 
and the more value of our puzzles increase, the more surprise hidden clues are in it. So these are different ways that they're attributing to justification of the higher um, price. So this is a story about pieces. I think it's such a success story because to be honest with you, if one of my students said, Tom, I want to sell puzzles on Amazon, I'll be like, don't do that. It's very saturated. But somehow, some way, these folks have basically thought of such a creative way to launch a product that to me, it goes to show that as long as you can have competitive advantages, any niche, any product can be a good product. A lot of people ask me, Tom, is supplement a good product or a good niche? Is puzzles a good niche? Is clothing a good niche? I say, guys, any niche is a good niche as long as you have justifications, as long as you can actually stand out among the marketplace with competitive advantages. How can you make them different? How can you satisfy your customers? How can you solve people's problems and stand out? So anyways, hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, smash the thumbs up button, comment something down below. If you guys have any more questions, uh, let me know. But other than that, I'll see you guys in the next video.